Howdy, my friends. Let me ask you a question. What disappoints you? Is it yourself? Is it circumstances you think you shouldn't have to go through? Is it what you think God should have done for you? Or maybe what you think you didn't do? Is it other people giving up on fulfilling their potential that disappoints you? Years ago, my mentor gave me advice I repeat often. And even a week ago, when I talked to him, he reminded me of these words. I can't want it for you more than you want it for yourself. And when I do that, I'm always disappointed if I want it for someone more than they want it. I'm disappointed most every time. You know, for me, it's difficult when those I, I have come to love will, might leave my coaching group before they've resolved their issues. Now, I can't help but be disappointed because I know they, they have likely quit right before they get their breakthrough. However, I also know God will keep working with them in his own way. He will lead them to their breakthrough when they really desire it and are willing to surrender to God completely in order to get that breakthrough. You know, I am not really, I would say, disappointed in them because I can leave them in God's hands so it doesn't overwhelm me or bother me with disappointment. He will activate their motivations, or as I say it, their want <laughs> They have to want it. I can't do that for them. Dealing with our own mess-ups and failures, though, can be much more difficult. Say we are a teacher seeing a student fail. It might disappoint us, but we can still do things to help them, right? We might offer extra help after school to, you know, get them up to par. Or we might work with their parents so they can understand how they can help them or get them in some kind of tutoring program. In other words, we can put together an action plan. It may or may not solve the issue, but at least we did something. We tried, right? And when it comes to our personal failures and disappointments, though, it is much more difficult. Like when we really want to lose weight and try but fail. It's disappointing when it doesn't go like we planned, right? And when we hit roadblocks within ourselves, it's hard to know what to do. It's also disappointing when you know you are doing everything correctly and yet the scale isn't moving. As a matter of fact, it's going the wrong way. <laughs> And you cut down on your calories and the scale is still stuck. Maybe the scale's broke, <laughs> you know, but you cry out to God to make it work and it still doesn't. And our hope is shot because we don't know what to do. I've been there and to be honest, I've had recent seasons of being disappointed. I'm not disappointed because I'm not doing the right things. I'm eating correctly, exercising which are two of the most important things for weight loss. However, I am disappointed because medical issues that I have are not being resolved. Disappointment can lead to discouragement, which may lead to giving up completely. And we think this will curtail our disappointment, but friends, that's not so. It only makes it worse because now we aren't doing anything, and that's even more disappointing. Then we start blaming God for everything that's going on. To say difficulties like this aren't disappointing would be a lie. They are disappointing. There is no way around that unless we place our hope in God. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says it this way, we can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they 
help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength and character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Now, hope is more than wishful thinking. Hope is a foundation that we build our lives on. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 deems hope as one of three things that will always be with us. Three things will last forever, forever. Hope, faith, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So love is the greatest. I agree with that. Of course, I agree with scripture. But, but hope and faith are the building blocks that hold love up. And without either of those, without hope or faith, love is not possible. The writer of Hebrews tells us that hope is our anchor. It's what tethers us to God. We cannot allow disappointment to steal our hope. If that happens, we are simply drifting out in the ocean somewhere without direction or purpose. Hebrews 6, 18 through 19 says, God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. What is hope? It's the foundation of faith. That's what Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we can't see. Now, faith, which is a, another one of those things that lasts forever that we just talked about, is the result of our hope. We can't see hope, but many times we can see our faith in action with what happens when we are praying and when we're believing God for something. When we pray and, and have the faith that God will answer, that's a direct result of our faith. Hope, though, had to already be there for anything to happen. And take the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She had this problem like for 12 years and she couldn't be around other people. She was unclean, had to live outside of towns. Think of, you know, how did she wash her clothes? How did she get her food? How did she make a living? She was living in disappointment, but she had hope that if she could somehow get through the crowd of people gathered around Jesus and touch the hem of his garment, she would be healed. And Luke 8, 44 tells us, coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe and immediately the bleeding stopped. Her healing was the result of three things. Her hope that Jesus would heal her, her faith that it would happen if she put her, her hope and her faith into action and touched this garment and the power that was within Jesus. And Jesus verified her healing when he said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. She had lived in disappointment all those years, and then Jesus came along. Hope was infused in her, and she thought, I can just get close enough, he will make me clean. Hope is the foundation for faith, but both the necessary ingredients to live this Christian life. This woman probably thought the world was against her. 
she may not have even known who God was. It doesn't say in scripture. Or she may have been blaming God for her difficulties. We don't even know. She knew nothing about Jesus except that he had been healing people and they had gotten well. The people Jesus has healed, like this woman, the, the man at the pool of Bethesda, the blind man, and many more, had been through hard times. We read these stories and we think, well, I'm so glad these poor people got healed. But they really didn't know Jesus at all. <laughs> After they got healed, they knew him better than we do. And I'm here to tell you that they understood more about Jesus than the scribes and Pharisees, more about him than the priests, more about him than the wealthiest individuals in their towns. Those who have always had everything handed to them, had no problem with no money worries or anything, who were prosperous in every way, aren't the ones who really understand Jesus the most. Those who have been through disappointment, pain, and heartache know a whole lot more about Jesus than anyone else. And that could be you, too, if you're going through disappointment. You know, Amy Carmichael, who was an Irish Christian missionary in India, wrote the poem, Make Me Thy Fuel. Uh, she, I mean, this was, I think she was in the 1800s. And the last stanza kind of talks about faith, hope, and love. And here it is. Give me the love that leads the way. The faith that nothing can dismay. The hope no disappointments tire. The passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink. To be a clod, make me thy fuel, flame of God. Now, the line I love is, give me the hope, no disappointments, tire. We can get tired of being constantly disappointed, can't we? <laughs> I know I do. We want everything to go smoothly, no problems, no difficulties. But without difficulties, we're not going to know how strong our hope in God really is. Faith and love physically demonstrate God's power in our lives, and we can see both of those in action. We can't see hope. It's kind of nebulous, right? But without it, faith and love are useless because they have no foundation. Hope grounds us in God and is the only thing that can help us manage our disappointments. Now, many times when disappointments come, my way at least, I sink into hopelessness. You probably do too. I mean, we've all tried to fix our issues ourselves and it hasn't worked. So we just give up. The devil loves to use any type of disappointment to just make us quit. That's what he wants. But God has a greater purpose in mind for our difficulties, troubles, trials, and disappointments. In the midst of everything falling apart, God wants us to trust him. We need to go to him with our disappointments. When everything feels hopeless, that's when we need to renew our hope in God. That's not really easy to do. And there's a book all about that, this in the Bible, Job. This guy, Job, knew he hadn't done anything wrong in God's eyes. How disappointing is it that he loses everything and God just stands by and watches? In times like that, I, I don't know if I could have hold, held on to my hope that God is going to come and rescue me. In Job 1.8, God, God calls Job the finest man in all the earth. Blameless, a man of complete integrity, who fears God and stays away from evil. The devil says, well, that's because you, you, God, you always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You made him prosper and everything. And then he says, but reach out and take everything he has 
and he will surely curse you to your face. So in order to, to prove a point to the enemy, God gives the devil permission to test Job with whatever he has, but not to harm him physically. And the devil can do anything to Job unless God gave him permission. Even when God gave the devil permission, he put limits on him. God was in charge. The evil one is not all powerful. God is. It's really easy to follow God when we're prospering, right? Well, what happens when disappointing, disappointment comes? Sorry, I'm going to get that word out. Disappoint. What happens when disappointment comes? What happens like when everything we have is on in just a few hours? Will we stay true to God? Are we the type of people God knows will continue to hope in him even when we face the biggest disappointments of our lives? Oh, God knew Job's heart and he knows ours. He knew that uh, Job would never curse him no matter what happened. Disappointment, though, comes our way at the most unforeseen time. So after this little discussion with God, the devil got busy. He took away all of Job's animals, killed all of his workers. Now, these possessions had made him the wealthiest dude in the area. He was the big guy. And after all these messengers came and told him about all of his livestock, another came telling him that all of his sons and daughters were killed in a freak storm. His response was to tear his robe in grief, shave his head, and fall down and worship God. Job 1, 21 through 22, records his response. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. It's amazing to me that, that Job could say that. He did not sin. He did not blame God. Then the next chapter of the devil, uh, the Lord tells the devil that Job has Maintained his integrity, even though you urged me to harm him without cause. And then Satan's comeback is, take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your faith. And so then God gave the devil the authority to, to do that. The only condition was that, that Job had to spare, I mean, that uh, Satan had to spare Job's life. So then Satan strikes Job with boils. Oh, that sounds horrible to me. And this is when his wife tells him to curse God and die. And Job's answer in two, uh, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 10 is, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. Then his three friends come. They grieve with him for like an entire week, sit with him in silence, which is probably the only right thing they did while they were with Job. But when Job finally spoke, it was apparent that he spoke out of pure disappointment with all that had happened to him. This is Job 3, 23 through 26. Why is life given to those with no future? Those God has surrounded with difficulties. I cannot eat for sign. My groans pour out like water. What I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest. Only trouble comes. And then one of his friends gives some advice, basically saying that God is disciplining Job for some sin that he must have done. But everything will be okay in the end. So, so buck up, friend. The problem with his friend's little talk is that Job knows he hasn't sinned and doesn't believe God is punishing him. So in the next chapter, Job says, one should be kind to a thinking friend, but you accuse me without any fear of the Almighty. And the message version adds, 
this section, my so-called friends, right? And he says they are, as Job says, that that his friends are as fickle as a gulch in the desert that is full of water one day for melting snow, but by summer, the, the gulches or the gullies are dry and baked in the sun. And travelers go out of their way to find water, and then they die of thirst. They arrive so confident, but what a disappointment. They get there, and their faces fall. And then Job gives them a hard truth. You, my so-called friends, are no better. There's nothing to you. One look at a hard scene, and you shrink in fear. It's not as though I ask you for anything. I didn't ask you for one red cent, nor did I beg you to go out on a limb for me. So why all of this dodging and shuffling? Stop assuming my guilt, for I have done no wrong. Job knows he hadn't sinned, but he was still disappointed. The situation was dire. He had lost everything. His hope was being sorely tested. The devil really wanted to squash Job's hope. He thought if he did that, the disappointment then would overwhelm Job and he would curse God. However, the devil couldn't read Job's mind and heart. Only God can do that. The devil can whisper to us in our ears, but and he can watch our actions to see what we might be thinking or feeling, but only God can read our minds. God knew Job's hope was intact, even though disappointment was there. The longer Job was in misery, the more disappointment hounded him. Answering another one of his friends, he says, um, this is in Job 19, God has demolished me on every side and I am finished. He has uprooted my hope like a falling tree. But then several verses later, Still in, in chapter 19, he lets us know that he's still hanging on to God, even though his hope is being tested. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. And my body has, and after my body has decayed, yet in my body, I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. The latter chapters of Job, God scolds Job for questioning why everything is happening to him. And God asks him, he asks him, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? Are you God's critic? But do you have the answer? And so Job responds, I had only heard about you before, but now, I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said. I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Even though Job questioned God, he never he never cursed him. God wasn't angry with Job, but he was angry with his three friends. In Job 42, 7, God tells them, I am angry with you. For you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job had. So God tells him to offer a specific sacrifice. And then he has Job pray for them. And so this is what he says. I will accept Job's prayer on your behalf. I will not treat you as you deserve. As he's talking to the friends. For you have not spoken accurately about me as my Servant Job has. So you remember after that, God blessed Job in the second half of his life more than in the beginning. He gave him more animals and more sons and daughters. And he lived 140 more years after that, saw four generations of his children and grandchildren. The last line of the book of Job says, Then he died, an old man who had lived a long, full life. Now, Job was a godly man who was disappointed with his circumstances. He never lost his hope. He never gave into sin. He never badmouthed God. 
he questioned why everything was happening to him, but he hung on to his hope in God. Now, we can be disappointed about things that happen to us, but if we still put our hope in God, he will rescue us. It may not be on our timetable, but he will do it. But see, I know it won't be on your timetable. It's never been on my timetable, but God has always rescued me. When everything is taken away from us, God is our only hope. He will keep the devil in his place. God is really good at disappointing the enemy if it helps to advance us in some way. It's just kind of like the story of Job. Joseph, when his brothers appear before him, remember, he says to them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. That's Genesis 50, 20. Now, he was talking to his brothers, but you know, it could have been Job talking to the devil. It could have been me talking to the devil about my supermorbid obesity. God used my disappointments about my enormous weight gain for good because when I finally surrendered to him, listened to him, I lost the weight and he showed me how. Then he put me on mission. He used me to write books, coach, speak, start a podcast, which has now been going for over three years. I really can't believe that, but it has. And God knew I would fall into the devil's temptations. He knew that about me. But because I finally lost 250 pounds with his help, he's using me to help others. I can use Joseph, Joseph to help many. And maybe you have just been disappointed, but guess what? God can reappoint you. He can change your trajectory and bring good out of your life. Joyce Meyer, one of my favorites, she says, with God, when we get disappointed, we can always make the decision to get reappointed. We can choose to look to him for new hope and renewed strength to go forward. That's the way to overcome disappointment. You know, David was often disappointed Psalms 24 or 27, 14 says, here's what I've learned through it all. Don't give up. Don't be impatient. Be entwined as one with the Lord. Be brave and courageous and never lose hope. Yes, keep on waiting for he will never disappoint you. Hope is definitely the key, my friends. Paul, who was, you know, shipwrecked, beaten, thrown into prison, and who knows what else, told the church in Ephesus, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. That's you, my friend, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior. You have been grafted in as a child of God and now a part of his glorious inheritance. Try to see disappointment as just like a momentary affliction. Let disappointment move you to make sure your hope is solidly anchored in God. Psalm 33, 20, David says, The Lord alone is our radiant hope. And we trust in him with all our hearts. His wraparound presence will strengthen us. Don't let the devil steal your hope. Foundation is your security in the midst of all of life's disappointments. So let me pray with you. Father God, I'm disappointed in my circumstances. I'm disappointed that things aren't going smoothly for me. Help me understand that difficulties don't always mean I've done something wrong. Sometimes they come to eventually strengthen me. I know you love me. I know you have my best interests at heart. 
And even if everything was gone from my life, I will still put my hope in you. You are my solid rock and my background presence. In Jesus' name, amen. My new book, Sweet Excuses, is available on Amazon. So get your copy and be sure to write a review. You can go to TeresaShieldsParker.com backslash books for more information about how to get that book. The link will be in the show notes. Until next week, my friends, sweet grace for your journey.